It's Authors Revealed, and I'm Becky Anderson. We are thrilled to have New York Times bestselling novelist Jocelyn Jackson and her new novel, Someone Else's Love Story. you got to read this one. Well, Jocelyn, welcome to Naperville and to Anderson. Thank you. We are thrilled to have you here. I'm really thrilled to yeah. be here. Your books are some of our favorite hand cells. Oh. We, and it was funny when I, I had someone, a customer call yesterday to talk about and describe to me the new book because I'm thinking about coming to the event tomorrow night. And it was so easy to describe. In some ways, it's hard. Really? But when you describe. Because I don't have a 30 second elevator I know speech, it. so I would love yours. But, but the thing <laughs> is, when you describe the essence of what it is, mm -hmm. then that's what cap captures people about, oh, about the book. So it was an easy thing. She says, oh, I'm, I'm coming for sure. She oh, says. good. So it was, it was really interesting. So I want to know, the book's been out only about two weeks now. Yes. So what are you hearing from your readers, your fans, about someone else's love story? Um, good stuff so far. I mean, it's been kind of yeah. a weird time to release a book because it's right in the middle of the Thanksgiving holiday. Right. So Your tour had a break. And yeah, and everybody's there. on vacation. Yeah, sure, so I've, sure. I feel like I'm, I'm just sort of yeah. floating amorphously in space. But I've been hearing, like... I keep getting emails from like weird places where I don't think of myself as that, like Vermont and Hawaii. I've gotten emails about this book. Oh, interesting. People, yeah, right, right. So I don't know. I mean, so far, and the reviews have been stellar. Like, no, they have I'm been. waiting I, I for read a hammer to drop. I, no, 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 it, it, no, and, and it's so deserved. The book was, oh, was fabulous, you. and we're, we're going to talk about it, but we can't, we're not going to do any spoilers. We want to yeah. watch those spoilers because we want people to pick it up. So, you know, the book, you know, and it starts with, you know, a couple of Emily Dickinson quotes right yes. at the beginning. And, you know, a lot, a lot of people know, you know, hope is the thing with feathers. Mm -hmm. You know, we all, yeah. we all know that one. And then Oh, you're faith. talking about the microscope one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and also, faith, faith is, is a fine invention, invention. If, when gentlemen can see, yeah. but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. <laughs> I, know. I love her cadences. Yeah. And, and to me, that quote, looking back on it, was great. For William, yes. in a way, you know, and a lot of that. But I want to know, and there's there's Emily throughout the book, a little yes. more Dickens. Is she one of your favorite poets? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, she is. Yeah. I'm, I'm having a weird thing here in my yeah. 40s where I've never been a poetry reader. Right. I like to have poetry read to me. Like, I will lie in a meadow. If you want to pet my hair and read me some poetry, <laughs> go, baby. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Or right. I like to go to poetry readings. Sure. But I'm such a fast reader that I don't read poetry very well. Yeah. No, Until I totally now, get that. Yeah. Here in my 40s, I've started really yeah. liking poetry in a way just to read it that I never have before. No, I love the way you put it, the, the three different sections, put it in the beginning. It, yeah. was, it was great. And it so fit it. And you, it's, yeah. it's sort of, especially when you look back at it and you read, read it, then it makes, it makes such sense. Well, I mean, every, everything Emily Dickinson wrote about, I mean, th there's so much of what is the driving theme in her poetry are the driving themes in the book. So, you know, I could have chosen, I, I really had to work to whittle it down to the, the quotes, sure. the four quotes that yeah. ended up in there. She could have chosen a lot of them. Yeah. Right? Sure, sure. So, so tell us with the story, someone else's love story. Tell us where, where that seed, that little spark. Oh, it began with a character one. named William Ash. I've been wanting to write about William Ash for 10 years. He is a rationalist. He is an atheist. He is a brilliant geneticist. He is on the high functioning end of the autism spectrum. Right. He is pragmatic to the point of mental illness. And I thought what fun it would be to take that character and smash him headfirst into some miracles. And not just see what that did to him, but right. see what that did to the miracles. <laughs> like he's kind of a force. Right, right. because it, everything is, is factual. Everything is, this is the way things have to be. Mm -hmm. But putting a little bit of that, you know, that, yeah. that magical realism to, and, and add, adding that sort of thing. And so, and the book is yeah, about, yeah. you know, it's a book yeah. about, there's a virgin birth, there's, right. A uh, holy sacrifice. There's more than one kind of resurrection in this book, right. but they're all fake. Like William can right. explain. Uh, all of them are explained. Yes, he can explain. But I'll right. tell you a secret. There's two real miracles in the book. They're tiny. They're these little, sen just they pop little tiny yeah. sentences where it's the finger of God touching the world, and it diffuses into the whole book. And the two little tiny real miracles change everything. So when people read it, they should be on they, the lookout. They, on the lookout for that. <laughs> and we're not going to say anything. No. There are no spoilers here. So, you know, 
you know, the way the book starts off, it starts off, boom, you're, you're into it. Yes. And two people meeting face to face, you know, with, with a barrel of a gun. Yes. Pointed in their faces. Yeah. And of course, well, it had to yeah. feel like fate. Like right. I wanted right. a bit, like the kind of, I don't know if you've ever had any, I'm sure you have, had one of those things in your life happen for good or, or for ill, where afterwards you keep thinking, if I hadn't spilled the milk, I would have left five minutes sooner. And then I never would have, and then this never would have, and my whole life would right, be... The, that chain effect, that domino effect yeah, of how life works. Where the so tiniest that. little, yeah. everything, you know, if Shandy hadn't gone back for that Coke, she would have been out of there before the robbery began. Yeah. And instead, she ends up in a, she's a young single mom, and she's in there with her three-year-old kid when yeah. it gets robbed. And will, I mean, she and William would never have spoken to each other right. on any planet, right. except, of course, it turns into a hostage situation, and, and so yeah. they come together very... Yeah. violently and out of necessity. You know, I, I think it, I don't think you set out to do this, but in a lot of your books, you, you, you tackle some difficult subjects. You I know? always set out to do that. <laughs> well, you set out to do it. Absolutely. But it doesn't, it's not apparent, like you're not being smacked in the face with it. No. You know, you're not. But it, you know, but it's real people. Yes. And even though, you know, it's, it's difficult, but is it hard to take those situations and put people into these situations? And... I'm believing it. These people are so real. I'm inside well, their heads. You. Is that a difficult task? I mean, is that, I mean, I'm sure it's a craft you have to work at. It's know? the fun part. Yeah. Like uh, for me, yeah. thinking about William for 10 years before I write the book, sure. that's really normal. Right. Like characters hang around for a long time with me before I'm ready to write okay. about them. Oh, that's interesting. And I know their histories and I know all their connections and I, I know them really, really well before the book okay. begins. Right. And then, I think I can get away, or so far I've been able to get away with going to some really dark places because yeah. I usually write characters with a good sense of humor. Yeah. So yeah. they use hu humor as a coping mechanism and it sort of provides a buoyancy that lets readers go into those dark sure. places without, without, without it just being yeah. an abattoir, right. you know? Right. <laughs> right, and having it be, I mean, such, such a downer, but the yes. thing is, intelligent people use humor. And, and I true. think that's it's 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 an important thing about a lot of people. We mm -hmm. use humor on a lot of to, to deal with. How it. else yeah. would we get through? Yeah. <laughs> the world is broken. That's right. And so the humor that the, the individual characters has, but the humor you add to the story. Yeah. It, it, it is a dark humor. Yeah. But it but, it, but it's 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 yeah. pretty real. It's pretty real. Yeah. yeah. I uh, there's there's a black humor within the world of the book, and then my yeah. characters are separately funny. I think of those as two yeah. different things, right. but. I guess they're part of the same thing. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. But you know, the story too is a lot of, and we can't tell a lot about the story because we'll give so much away, but a story of redemption, what happens to some people. Yeah. Because I love the way you start off the story and they meet and the whole thing that happens in this Circle K, yeah. this gas station, and what happens to these two, two people. But you go back to their backstories. Oh, yes. And what I was wondering, you know, you're telling their backstories in their lives of, of what happened before this this hap happenstance sort of meeting mm -hmm. with this circumstance. When you were writing the backstories and what's happening in the present, did you find yourself changing bits and parts of the front and the back of the, the story? Front. The front. The front. The, oh, the present is always a slave to the past. We are a, okay. the culmination of our choices and our histories. Okay. Okay. And so I could feel like they have to stay the same person. Yeah. The boy, you know, the boy that we see William Ash being when he courts his wife, when he's right. a very young man, he has to be that same person at 35 in a in a really truthful way yeah. so yeah and i know i know the the past before i began the okay so that's what i was wondering mutable. yeah so you see so you wrote the past the backstories before you went i didn't write it i knew it you knew it okay yeah i don't take notes wow if it's important it it's comes all, back and it yeah. sticks and well, it gets so really loud and becomes immutable yeah and if it falls away then i wasn't that interested in it <laughs> yeah. no, no that's really interesting also too you know this this book to me it's all about, it, you know, it has some those religious themes in it, but to me mm -hmm. it's more about having faith and having faith in each other. It is about faith. Yeah. It, I, I am a person of faith, but and I decidedly believe in God, but I'm not sure the book does. Oh, okay. The book okay, is, because so many of the people in the book are agnostics or atheists, some of the people in the book have very violent sorts of faith that... Uh, it, it was really more about the human relationship with faith than, yeah. than some kind of the idea of the relationship with the divine. Like, I think 
it's because faith is so incredibly powerful. And because it's so powerful, it can be used against you in really terrible ways, or it can be an amazing force for human driven good. Right. And, right. and that's what I was interested in in the book was looking at the way, at, at how faith is used and misused by people. Right, right. And there's a lot of different instances where you show that. Yeah. yeah. So, so Shandy, she's such an she's such an interesting character. It's such a great sense of humor, and you really do feel like you. She could be your friend, you know, in some yeah. ways, and the way way you relate to her. Is she? Is she I know, and, and I'm sure you've been asked this a million times about her. Is she based on on anybody? No. So that's just she's just my yeah. characters, my adult characters. My friend Charlotte has explained it better than anyone I've ever heard. Okay. She's okay. known me since we were kids, yeah. and she said reading one of my books is like I've taken her and her family and me and my family and everybody we ever knew and put them in a Cuisinart. Okay. And then she reads this book and she doesn't yeah. know any of the people and she knows none of this stuff ever happened. But it's like I've dipped my fingers into that sauce in the Cuisinart and done this. And she can see little speckles and bits and words and images. Yeah, that or something come, that, that stays with you. Like, you're or, never going to find my yeah. Aunt Susan in any of my books, but you might find a speck of Aunt Susan in sure. six different characters. Okay, so Dr. William Ash, the yes. character in this. What an interesting guy. And yeah. I, you know, just want to, you know, he, he's our hero from the start, you know, yes. what, he, what he does at the beginning, and we won't do any spoilers, you know. So he's a geneticist, you know, he's, yes. he's a brilliant, brilliant mind, but it has, you know, that, that Asperger's yes. aspect to him. Um, how did you write him? Because you're writing from a different kind of angle. It's not first person, but it's... Your it secretly it's is. Secret. <laughs> well, it is. But it's it, it's third, you know, usually yeah, third person directed yeah, sits yeah, on a character's right, shoulder, yeah. but even that was too distant. This is third person, person like right, right in, present. in his eyeball. Yeah. Um, How was that? Because have you ever written any of your other characters, yes. your previous books from that perspective? Uh, from and, third person, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, but how was like doing a man though, doing a man? Um, well, he's not also not the first man I've written. He, yeah. It's just the first published the, oh, okay. the novel I wrote before Gods in Alabama oh, had a male okay. narrator, so oh, interesting. that okay. wasn't too different. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with William was um, I wanted to have a character who was on the autism spectrum in a book that wasn't at all about being on the autism right, spectrum. Right, exactly. But he, that's just part of who he is. And I think that's kind of where we are now. Yeah. I mean, it has become so common, and so many people who, who have Asperger's, or as they're now saying, which I don't really like. They're, they've kind of tried to make it all one thing on the spectrum. Like a lot of yeah, people, I'm not right. comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, but what they, it's just such a, I don't, it, it's just so, because those people are so successful in a lot of cases. Yeah, that's right. They're marrying, they're having kids. Those genes are, that's evolution, baby. Yeah. Those genes are useful in a lot of ways. Yeah, so we're seeing right. more and more of it. Right. And that's just how a lot of people are. So I, I didn't want to write a book about that, right. but I just wanted him to be who he was. Did you do any research on, on that to get oh, sort yeah. of some of the aspects of it? Or any course. research on anything else? You know, oh, genetics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hung out with a lot of Emory gen geneticists. That's a party crowd. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, they probably could be. Who knows? Yeah. No, they actually are. They're really cool, like spooky smart. Oh, wow. I hung out with genetic counselors and nurses who were spooky smart, nifty people and I would have them read sections of it for me and oh, interesting. and get yeah, and the, make sure that you had the science right. was right oh, you know wow. anything I got wrong that was me yeah. because they they know their yeah. stuff was that enjoyable that part of super of enjoyable yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm so interested in that well, I'm so interested in how much we are created out of this code in ourselves it's when I remember when my son was born, my husband, the first thing Scott said was, I said, what does he look like? And Scott said, he looks familiar. Uh -huh. Well, that's interesting. And he had deja vu looking at him because the kid looks so much like my husband's family. Mm -hmm. And then I see little weird behaviors, things I did as a child I've seen my children do, and they didn't know that I've done them. Yeah, right. Like, I was a penny sucker. That William thing where he always has a penny yeah, in his right, mouth. Right. I always had a penny hidden in my mouth. I found the tang of the copper really comforting. But by the time I was 12 or 13, I'd kind of outgrown it. I didn't do right, it anymore. Right. I was peeling pennies out of my son's mouth. Oh, interesting. Up until he was 10 years old. And he, he had no idea that I had done that. 
that I mean, that's, genes that's, are spooky. That, no, no, and it's, it's well, it's behavior. It's not just well, the way you look, the yes. way everything, but there's there's behavioral yeah. things that you inherit. That's so cool. So tell me about Natty Bumpo. Now that's the thing. When I say I make up all my adult characters, you can't make up kids. They are too freaking weird. <laughs> You can't access that mindset anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. you look at a baby in a high chair and they do the thing where they drop. Sure. Yeah. You know why? Because they don't know it will go down every time. Like, you, you how can After you get into a mindset yeah. where you gravity is not part of your extant things that you just know? So kids, I tend to use my own oh, children and my niece wondering. and nephew yeah. and yeah. almost everything Natty says my son or daughter has okay, said. I was wondering that. They both talk like 40-year-old accountants. <laughs> This hill is making me exhausted. I have to consider those peas. He didn't like peas. I have to consider those peas. He'd have to think about it really hard before yeah. he could make himself yeah. eat them. And well, so he's, I... He's, he's a singular little boy, though. And yeah. I love the call out to James Fenimore Cooper though, with his name. I love that. I love that. That was great. That was great. And Natty Bumpo, you know, Shandy is kind of a cross-cultural person. She's in the middle yeah. of a culture war. And Natty Bumpo is definitely a cross-cultural character. So that's I thought true. that was really yeah, that's interesting. True. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I love the, the book, and I know with William, um, there's a book by Jost Elfers, and we sold, I have hand sold so many of those over the years. How are you peeling? Isn't that a wonderful book? It's the book? best book, yeah. and so many teachers loved it because it's a great way to show emotion. Yes. But using fruits and vegetables. Using fruit, and the, the expressions are so accurate in that book. Oh, no, the radish is happy. He, we, we had him for an event. Incredible oh, how you? he would, and he would carve stuff right then yeah. and there and showing emotions on, on using different fruits. It yeah. I just put that book yeah. right into my book. And I thought, yeah. like, I didn't, I wasn't, like some of the vegetables he uses are really weird. So I just used, I just made it a turnip, a radish, yeah, a, sure, sure. just to not have to like look up what kind of squash that was. But it's it's based yeah. on that book, yeah, the, yeah, the book yeah. that William has as a child. Right. You know, I, I know this is your sixth novel, right? Yes. This is your sixth novel. And a lot of the stuff that you write about, you always have people, not on the, on, on the edge of society, but people who have uh, oddities. Yes. But to me, I don't think of it that way. I think there's so many people we know, and even ourselves, where we have our I own think little quirks. We're all oddities. We all we're all odd in our we're own all on the special fringe. way. Right? I don't know anyone who actually thinks of themselves as an insider looking out. We're all standing outside of something that's with our right. noses that's pressed right. up against it. Yeah. I think that's the human condition. Yeah. But I think all of your characters, to me, you know somebody who is somewhat like that, or somebody who you can say, I know someone who does that. Mm -hmm. Or, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't take it out of the realm of, of believability. These are all very real people. To me, they're very real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad if they read that way to you too. No, no, they totally do. Yeah. Um, going back, did, now you said you don't outline. No. You keep this all in your head. Yes. And you sit down and just go. Well, I don't, plot comes last. I know uh, characters really, really well. I know their backstory. I understand yeah. their relationships. Okay. Plot happens as I write. That's my cookie. I like, you know, character drives my car, and then I've got theme in the front right. seat. Sure. I, but I also, I like a big old scoop of plot. I like there to be some kissing and some shooting, usually within a couple of pages of each other. Yeah. Yeah. But that comes last. Yeah. Like, that's... That's fun, you know. That's sure. play. That's yeah. play. That's. But that makes it enjoyable for you, just yes. as it does for us when we're. Oh yes, it. things yeah. happen that just surprise the heck yeah. out of me. I'm like, oh, that's fun. Let's do that, you know. But see, that's cool for us when yeah. we're reading. So that's oh, that's cool. I like that's a twisty cool. little yeah. plot. Yeah. Um, so you were an actress. I was, but yeah. mostly a playwright. A playwright, okay. Yeah, I so, did so some acting. So you know what appeals. You can you can bring that 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 drama, that stuff, to mm -hmm. the written page. That really. I'm sure all that experience has helped you in your writing. Well, I was a terrible playwright, to be <laughs> honest with you. Because if you're going to write a play, yeah. you have to leave so much room. Yeah. You have to leave so much room for a director and room for a cast. And I'm not collaborative like that with my writing. Uh -huh. and, and what's weird is novel writing feels more like acting than like playwriting. It, Interesting. Playwriting yeah. sort of happened up here in my brain and was really stressful and I was really worried about what people would do with it and how to box people in so that it would be the way I wanted it to be. With novel writing, I don't have to, I can just write. And with acting, I'm just working within a framework and it, that feels, that comes from back here and it's okay. a much more pleasant experience. Oh. 
I'm better at both of them. Right. Playwriting, I'm terrible. <laughs> okay, okay. But you record your own audio books. I do. Which I think I love is it. so, I think that makes a huge difference. When, when an author is really good at that, it, to me, it brings a story to, to the intent that you, you know, the, what you want to you put into it. Yeah. But when you're reading it, do you ever think, oh, I should have changed that? Um, are, you, are you okay with that? Not, not usually because long before we come to the audiobook thing, I, I always read books aloud to myself. Okay. I, that's, like, I never have sent in a book where I haven't read it all aloud at least once. Uh -huh. Because, you know, sometimes if you don't read it out, out loud, there will be sentences where you fall into iambic, iambic pentameter and, you know, they'll oh. be, and that makes me crazy in books as a reader. I just, I hate that. So I, I read everything aloud and also like any dialogue that you can't say out loud it, you can feel it feel wrong in your mouth. It doesn't and you're feel like, authentic. That's stilted. That's right. not how she would say that. Right. So. So it's kind of your self check. Are yeah. You ready? Yeah. 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 Oh. So basically, when you're recording the audio books of all your novels, you you've already done a lot of run throughs. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, that's 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 very interesting. Um, so did you did you grow up in the South or did you move around a lot? Um, both. Okay. I was born on the Redneck Riviera at Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and my dad was Army. Okay. And I lived in about six or seven states, but all except one were Southern. Okay. And then they retired. When my dad retired, when I was in third grade, we went back to the Redneck Riviera, and I finished growing up in Pensacola, Florida. Okay. Well, so when are all your books, you know, mostly set in, well, in the South, yes. you know, whether it's Georgia, Alabama, what, what, what is it about the South that adds such great fodder well, or a, setting? Or There's a couple of things. Okay. First of all, Southerners... There is an automatic, if you're a thinking person who has even a minimal understanding of history and you are from the South, there must be ambivalence. It's a wonderful place and I love it deeply and I am ambivalent about that. <laughs> so that's already okay. interesting. Like yeah, just sure. that inbuilt ambivalence to the blackened, bloody soil of my beloved homeland. Right. That's just there. Okay. The other thing is... Um, you know, I didn't realize how culturally weird we were until I moved here. I lived in Chicago for seven years. I lived oh, in Oak Park oh, and in did. Chicago, okay. yeah. Right. And okay. um, I realized we kind of spoke a different language. Mm. Like, I remember someone asking me to be on some hideous academic committee that sounded to me like, you know, hell on earth. And me saying in a Southern way, very clearly, I will kill your mother before I will be on that committee. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I was on the committee. Because my, you know, in the South, if I say to you, oh, that just sounds wonderful. I can't tell you how much I'd love to do that. But I am going to have to check my schedule and just make sure, even though I can't even tell you, that would be great. Yeah. Like, that means yes in Chicago. In South, that means I will burn your house down and sow your fields with salt <laughs> before I'll be on that committee. Oh, oh, that's so, good. so part of it is wanting to capture the culture that right. I realized was so different. And then the last part is sense of place. I don't write places if I don't know what they smell like. So my books are always going to be set in a place I've lived, smelled, touched. Sure. I've set yeah. books in Chicago because I know that town seven years I have. And California, I've spent, um, I wanted to write a third of a book set in California. So I moved out there and lived in my friend's basement for three weeks. I couldn't write like a native Californian, but I sure know what a redneck would think of Berkeley. So, <laughs> and that's all. Well, and I spent, like, and yeah, my, yeah. my narrator was kind of a redneck, yeah. so it, it, I, I went out there and sniffed around, yeah. and yeah. then yeah. I could write California, but I can't, I have to, it has to do with making the sure. place. Sure. And that's not really about, like, putting a Krispy Kreme on the right corner of the town. I don't really care so much about that. I want it, like, I want my little town in Georgia to feel like any small town oh, south sure. yeah. town. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So tell us about your blog. Oh, faster yeah, than kudzu. Yeah, faster kudzu. than kudzu. I love that. You know, oh, I know kudzu. Oh, yeah, I know kudzu. Kudzu is a yeah. vine that eats everything, and it grows yeah. so fast that if you blink and look away, yeah. it gr yeah. it's just it's famous for being so for being a fast growing thing. And so yeah. Yeah. I always say I called it faster than kudzu because I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love the name of it. So, um, as an author, how has how has all the social networking changed your life as an author? The can it can blog it be can it totally name. suck you in? Sometimes is, um, it, is it is it a time suck? Is well, it, you know, like, nothing yeah. good is yeah. going to happen if you open Facebook. You wake up four <laughs> hours later, yeah, right. saturated right. in kitten yeah. pictures, and yeah. but because there's so many people I genuinely love on sure. there, and I want to 
why I want to see their kids riding lessons. So I sit there watching, oh, Sadie's gotten so tall or, or whatever it is. So yeah, it's a time suck, but a pleasant one. But the blog is different. The blog is a neat community. Yeah. These, uh, there are people who've been, I've been writing that blog since before it was published and there are people who I've known for 10 and 12 years, yeah. you know, yeah. just yeah. who hang out there. Yeah. That's great. I, one of them recently sold her first novel. I blurbed her book, and I had met her on my blog years before. Oh, wow. Really cool. yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Okay, you know, the, what are the, the things about the book? And, and this has always been that, that age-old question. Can men and women be friends? Yes. Is it, okay. And <laughs> this, is, this is part of that's in this, you know. And, and wondering, is it best to be friends? And then, because there's a difference between, you know, if people are looking for romance, you mm -hmm. know, it's different than love. Yes, you know? but 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 that friendship before love, or is it what is it a prerequisite for for real love? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's sometimes, I'm sure, people are. Yeah. You, how we come to love is crazy and weird, yeah. and the fact yeah. that we do it at all is insane, yeah. because mortality. But yeah. um, it's insane and brave to love the way we yeah. people do. We just endlessly want to connect, only connect. Ian Forster yeah. said, yeah. and I say amen. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, there's two sets of male-female best friends in this book. Shandy's best friend is That's Walcott, right. and William's best friend is Paula. And I, I wrote a book, before I wrote this book, I wrote a book called A Grown-Up Kind of Pretty that had male-female best friends in it who were 15. And when I when I ha, I'd been thinking about William for a long time, mm -hmm. and I had finally figured out Shandy would be in the book too, I'd been thinking about her separately, and her best friend was Cece. She had a female best friend, but after writing a grown-up kind of pretty with these 15-year-old best friends, Shandy's 21, William is an adult man probably in his 30s, 36 or so. Um, I wanted to, to write that relationship more. I mean, they're not really, the people aren't anything alike, but the dynamics of a male-female friendship. So I moved Cece to be Walcott's girlfriend and invented Walcott to, um, and then William's best friend was always Paula. And, and it was... I, I couldn't do it for a long time. I, I had, because I think the most powerful thing about sex is its questions and its possibility. And no matter what I did, the possibility was there. Mm -hmm. So finally, in a stroke of desperation, I was like, okay, they've all already slept together. William has already slept with Paula, and Shandy has already slept with Walcott. And, and that happened yeah, this so years ago, and, and th those questions have been answered. Yeah. And so there was no, it, it allowed them there, to there just, was, yeah. it was a cheat, I think, because, because but, but I needed that removed, yeah, removed to do sure. what was important sure. in the book. Yeah. And that was the only way I could get rid of no, it. No, but I just love the friendships. And yeah. The, yeah. It was They're just neat. fantastic. Great conversation. What fun we've just had with New York Times bestselling author Jocelyn Jackson about her new novel. It's called Someone Else's Love Story. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed.